we were set to treat that patient when she was maybe as early as uh, as 18 months old, I think we were lined up for, and there was a problem with the initial manufacturing of the vector. And so we kept delaying and delaying, and she ended up not being treated till she was about 30 months old, which is older than we would like to do it. But interestingly, she uh, she's done quite well in the sense she had already lost a lot of developmental function, but she, after the treatment has stopped having seizures, uh, her condition has stabilized uh, very much. And now she's almost, she's approaching six years old uh, and she's not had further progression. And you know, so it's, um, She's stabilized at a low level, but it is the family is very pleased with what um, has transpired. She interacts with her, her brother, who is um, younger but bigger than she, and um, does not have does not have Tay Sachs disease. The, the second patient we don't have as much detailed follow up on. Um, they've chosen not to stay in close contact with us, but we have um, they've given us permission to check in on their medical records periodically and they have done relatively well. That, that patient was actually the third affected child in a family. And this patient has been the least affected of the, of the three. Um, has had very mild uh, seizures uh, and has had um, uh, some a partial stabilization of her progression, um, certainly exceeding the, the uh, doing better than her prior siblings with this obviously had the same uh, genetics. And, um, and so both of those we would consider as uh, positive results in terms of uh, what we would describe more as stabilization and, and slowing of progression. In one case, probably totally stabilized in the other case, stabilized, but after having uh, some slow progression and then, uh, you know, generally, generally more stable also in terms of the, uh, the seizure component. Uh, I'm really not, I can't, um, not at liberty to talk about the second trial because of our other, you know, partners and so forth. But I'll just say that nothing's really changed in our assessment uh, from what we've just published in Nature Medicine. We're having a, not a big change in the total dose, but as we go up, between different patients, we're injecting more of it into the thalamus on each side. And that's because we think the thalamus dose, based on studies done by our collaborators who work in, uh, particularly with the Tay Sachs sheep, um, we think that the part in the thalamus has much more potent effect on being able to get to all the neurons uh, in. Uh, throughout the cerebral cortex at least. And, and uh, so the, the, uh, there's a small increase in the dose, the total vector genome dose, they're all around 10 to the 14 vector genome going a little bit up from there, but the, but the amount of volume into the thalamus continually increases. And the reason you know, for that is it is a relatively invasive technique and uh, it is actually done with a robotic uh, surgical assistant and it is uh, an image guided catheter. So there really hasn't caused any bleeding or any problems at the site, but it, uh, because there's really no prior experience with doing this with gene therapy, we really did have to put a, a small volume in in the first patient and then progressively more and more volume in the thalamus as we've progressed through the trial. So we are doing an, an additional follow-up trial now. So five additional patients actually have, uh, have already uh, been treated um, with the same uh, product where we published the first two patients. And so I can tell you exactly how we're doing that. So we're doing it a little, we're doing the treatment the same in, the, in this new study uh, which is being sponsored by Sio Therapeutics. The, um, the patients come to Massachusetts. 
they get evaluated with regard to their neurologic function and their MRI at Mass General uh, with our partner there, Dr. Eichler. Then they come here to uh, UMass Chan Medical School. And what we do is we start them two weeks prior with immune suppression uh, with three different uh, drugs, two weeks prior to the injection. And then, um, then they have the uh, deep brain injections done by Dr. Chetel Tepe, who is our neurosurgeon. Uh, and, uh, and then the following day, he also does the infusion into the spinal cord. So um, uh, then after that, they're on immune suppressive medications uh, for one of them for three months, the other for six months. And they, uh, uh, but the, you know, generally they're in the hospital for three or four days to begin the immune suppression and get some other imaging and stuff done in another three or four days around the time of the surgery. Um, and then after that, we do generally outpatient uh, follow-up treatment. Uh, they come back to uh, us uh, at UMass Chan for the management of the immune suppression and then any complications uh, for all the safety evaluations. And then they go back at three months and then six months and a year and two years um, or uh, looking for benefits um, from the treatment at the, at the Mass General site, which is really it's only um, 40 miles down the road from us. Um, but Dr. Eichler is doing that part because he has the, the greatest amount of, uh, he's got the sort of word, world's leading experience with um, following uh, the natural history of these patients. We're doing the management of the gene therapy because uh, I have experience with doing that um, since uh, clinic in patients since 1995. So that's a long experience um, of managing this in patients who have various kinds of genetic diseases.